Good afternoon, and thank you so much for joining us. I'm Jessica Kearney, Assistant Vice President here at the Travelers Institute, filling in for Joan Woodward this week. Welcome to Wednesdays with Woodward, a webinar series where we convene leading experts for conversations on some of today's biggest challenges. If you've joined us on this program before, you might have heard conversations on things like cybersecurity, the economy, or auto safety, all through the lens that we bring from the insurance industry. Today, we're going to do something a little bit different. We're going to get a little more personal. Have you ever walked into a networking event with lots of people and just felt totally overwhelmed, didn't know where to start, or maybe you even wanted to hide in the bathroom, or maybe you're more comfortable in those settings and maybe just not getting the traction that you want or the connections that you're making are just starting to fizzle out. And let's face it, the last few years have been a little rough. They've been isolating. And so maybe your network is just a little rusty and it needs some dusting off. So today we're gonna go there, the lost art of connecting, of human connection, and why we feel happier when we have it and why it helps power successful careers in business. And importantly today, we're gonna hopefully de deliver a message of optimism. So even if connecting isn't something that comes naturally to you, not to worry, our guest today is gonna to show us how this can really be a learned skill. I hope the next hour will arm us all with some really practical guidance that we can start implementing today to reclaim the lost art of connecting. Before we get started, I'd like to share our disclaimer about today's program. I'd also like to thank our webinar partners today. You'll, you'll see here on screen, the Masters in FinTech program at the University of Connecticut School of Business, the Metro Hartford Alliance, Big Eye Minnesota. And we're also thrilled to partner with two wonderful groups within our own travelers community, advocating for women and helping them advance their careers in the insurance industry, the Travelers Women and Allies Diversity Network and She Travels. So thank you so much to all these groups. We really appreciate your participation and, and being here with us for this conversation. And with that, I'd like to introduce today's speaker, Susan McPherson. Susan is the founder and CEO of McPherson Strategies, a communications consultancy focused on the intersections of brands and social impact. She has 25 plus years of experience in marketing, public relations, and sustainability communications, and she's a regular contributor to the national media. She is the recipient of Forbes Magazine's 50 Over 50 Impact 2021 Award and Worth Media's Worthy 100 Award. She is also the author of The Lost Art of Connecting, the gather, ask, do method for building meaningful relationships. The foundation of our discussion today, and I, I have the book uh, right here with me, and I know a number of you got, got copies as well. This book is a really practical guide. So no matter where your network stands today, our goal is to get granular on some specific approaches, tips, tricks that will help you better connect and build your constellation of networks. Um, and with that, I'm so pleased to bring in Susan. Susan, thank you so much for being here with us today. Jessica, I am so honored and grateful, and it's wonderful to be here with you and all your colleagues. Thank you. So let's get right into it. And I think, you know, just, just off the top, I, I just held up your book, um, which we're really excited to dig into and talk about. Can you tell us about the book, about the lost art of connecting? Sure. And can sure. you break that down for the audience? Absolutely. Well, when people see the title, they often assume I wrote it in response to the pandemic, correct? However, I actually wrote it during the pandemic, and I started to write it in February of 22, uh, of tw excuse me, February 2020, and we all know what happened in March. Um, but the original impetus for writing the book was really to um, pivot away from classic networking, which so many of us have learned how to do since the beginnings of our career, and learned how to be very almost, dare I say, transactional. Mm -hmm. My goal was to flip that on its head and instead create a meaningful way to connect and network, leading with, get this, how I can be helpful to others. So instead of when we walk into a room and we think about, hmm, what can I gain? What can I walk away with? Who can I meet that's going to help me get that next thing, that next bright, shiny star? Instead walk into a room virtual or in real life and think about how can I be helpful? What are my superpowers that I can be using to lead the way? So that essentially, and I'll tell you one other thing, four or five years ago, a friend of mine told me that when she took her son and daughter to the school bus every day, 
and she would hug them goodbye and they get up on the yellow, big yellow school bus. As soon as they took their respective seats, their heads would bop down to look at their handheld devices. And every other child on the school bus was doing the same. Now, my school bus memories are not all, you know, that, believe me. But I talked to my fellow classmates and that is what sparked me to write the book. That's amazing. And I know uh, you see pictures today in the media or on social media of just crowds of people, right? And just the number of people that are looking down on their phones. And I, I think that's going to be one of the themes that we talk about today over the next hour is obviously technology. Our, our whole way of communication has been upended. It's changed. Uh, and it's never going back to the way that it was before. But where do we, how do we find that balance? And, and where do we bring it into, in, into perspective? Um, I'm very excited to bring the audience in. We've got two audience polling questions we thought would be interesting really just to kick off the conversation and see where we are. And I know I shared this with you just before we came on, but we've had um, you know, such a strong reaction to this program. So many people signing up and submitting just terrific audience questions and really sharing their own vulnerabilities um, that it's been very moving. So I'm looking forward to getting into those conversations and uh, you know, bringing what people actually really have on their minds today. So we've got the first polling question up. I see some people are already uh, responding. What's the status of your professional network today? And uh, this is totally anonymous. So, um, you know, it's a safe space. So, so be brutally honest. Is it thriving? Are you in okay shape or does it need help? And I'm just looking at some of the initial responses here. About half of us say it's in okay shape. 42% need help. So uh, clearly we've got um, some good conversation to be had. And then let's move on to our second polling question just to kick things off. What is your level of comfort in situations where you're expected to network or make connections? These are great questions. All right, we've got about 10% of people saying they avoid networking and social events altogether. Uh, another third saying they're uncomfortable. So it's about split between comfortable and uncomfortable with some varying. Can you react to those to those two polling results? Well, I, I first of all, you know, we've been out of practice, right? I mean, clearly, I mean, I and I'm a complete extrovert, as you can probably already tell. But I will go to an event and I will feel somewhat rusty and uncomfortable. But I like to think it's a bit like riding a bike. Um, every spring, you know, when I get my bike out of storage here and I live in, in Brooklyn Heights, the first four blocks I'm riding it, I'm convinced I'm going to die. Um, and then by about the fifth block, I'm like, oh, I got this. So I think part of that re reticence is people who, you know, literally have been out of practice. But I think also on the on the positive side, I think, you know, we now have something that we all can connect on. I mean, everyone on this planet has been affected by this pandemic. Obviously, some people way worse, and we know people lost loved ones and livelihoods, et cetera. But this is almost the first time that all of us, no matter where you live, no matter what socioeconomic class you're, you're representative, what religion you are, you were affected. So in some ways, when we go to events, whether they're virtual or in person, we have something that we can connect on. Um, so I think in some ways that helps give us safety that we didn't have prior. Yeah, it's a very interesting topic you mentioned starting writing this book in you know February 2020 and to be writing about this topic. And, and just off the top here, and I'm sure we'll get into this uh, more, but how did that affect the writing process and how this evolved? Is your well, um, the good thing is, is at least we had no idea how long it was going to go on. I think if somebody had told any of us in March of 2020 that, you know, two years later, we'd still be, you know, or two and a half years later, we'd still be dealing with the ramifications from it. So for me, it was a grounding um, because it was um, something to focus on. Uh, also, I interviewed about 35 different leaders who have made connecting or have felt that connecting powered their success. And so by interviewing them, it gave me hope for the future because we were all grappling with how do we stay connected? So hearing from people like Adam Grant and Brooke Baldwin, um, who was an anchor on CNN and Whitney Johnson, a, a major business thinker, talk about how they were never ever going to take for granted their connections. 
gave me a lot of um, hope for the future. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so let's jump right in. So this is the gather, ask, do method. Obviously, there's three steps, and we're going to go in that order and walk people through some of the methodology and the tips and tricks. So let's start with gather. Can you can you tell us a little sure. bit about the, the first portion of your book? Sure. Um, and just let me ground it in a little bit of reality. Um, I founded my company, McPherson Strategies, when I was 48. Um, I'm now 58. Um, so we are going on 10 years, but 90% of our business over the last two, 10 years has been inbound. So what that taught me was the connections, the communities that I started building in my 20s, in my 30s, in my 40s, actually turned into something much bigger than connections um, or contacts on LinkedIn. So one of the important kind of grounding methodologies for that, for the book came from that. So that for those of you who are just starting out in your career or those of you in business develop development or sales, connections really mean success. And we need meaningful connections to drive our business. And I do believe there's proof in the pudding when I look at the success of, of, our, of my company. So the methodology is such, it's grounded in my professional experience, but we start with gather. And first and foremost in gather, you connect with the most important person in your life. And I can't see the audience, but if I could see a show of hands, I wonder who you think the most important person is to connect with. Yes, you are right, yourself. And you do a self-analysis to find out what your superpowers are. Because if you remember a few minutes ago, I shared that the underlying theme of the entire book is leading with how we can be helpful to others. Mm -hmm. Well, if we don't know what our superpowers are, and notice it's superpowers, not power, because we have many of them, we need to understand how we can be supporting others. Also in the gather phase, you think about what your goals are over the next one year, three year, say five years. And you think about who you wanna connect with or reconnect with that are gonna help you meet your goals, but also ways you can be helpful to others meeting their goals. And lastly in gather, you think about the all important nuance that we live in hermetically sealed bubbles, myself included, where we tend to surround ourselves with people who look like us, sound like us, the same age, race, and color as us. So how are we going to do everything we can to break out of that bubble so that we can meet people who aren't like us? Because in the end, that is also what is going to lead to a much more enriching personal and professional life. So that is very much the gather phase um, at a very 30,000 foot view. Yeah, and let's pick up on, you, you mentioned, you know, starting, starting with yourself and this process and really getting to know yourself and, and your goals. Can you talk about that a little bit more just as, as people are starting to frame this for themselves and sure, kind of what, sure. what types of things should they be thinking about or trying to be introspective about? Well, first and foremost, it's hard, right? Um, because many of us suffer from imposter syndrome or lack of confidence or think, depending on where we are for approaching retirement, what the hell? What, what are our superpowers? How can we be helpful? Or if we're just starting out and just perhaps graduated community college or college and we're thinking we have nothing to add. But this is where somebody in your community, a best friend, a partner, a spouse, a parent, even a child, heck, your dog, could tell you what your superpowers are. And I'll tell you a quick story. In 2007, I went on a retreat with eight of my dearest friends. And our goal of that retreat was to come up with our elevator speeches. And if some of you may recall, 2007, 2008 was a real kind of um, uh, reflective period because social media was starting to really take hold. And it was very important that we could articulate who we are very succinctly, hence the name elevator speech. And the goal was over that weekend that by Sunday, we would each be able to say what our superpowers were quickly, eloquently, and being articulate. So it was that weekend I finally said, hi, I'm Susan McPherson, and I'm a serial connector blah, 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 blah. And of course I wanted to pee in my pants because it sounded so ridiculous. What the hell is a serial connector? 
But now, 16 years later, I wrote a book on it. So I tell that story because I felt safe and I felt comfortable because I was in the company of eight of my dearest friends. Mm -hmm. So to me right now, this exercise is really important um, for connecting for anything, um, but also know that you all have superpowers and it doesn't have to mean you have a PhD in physics, okay? You could be incredible at you know speaking multiple languages. You could make... A, a, a fabulous to, tomatoes or spaghetti sauce. So I, I'm being kind of silly, but I think the point is, is it takes looking in, it takes asking others, um, but don't be afraid to literally request this from people that you know. I make lists. I'm a big list maker. <laughs> That's terrific. Thank you for sharing that. Now, yeah, I was going to ask you some examples of superpowers. So that was that was some those were some <laughs> very good, tangible ones. Um, be thinking about our uh, spaghetti sauce. So. Uh, we, tend, we tend to think it has to be something. And also just remember, um, as the 58 year old woman in the room, you're going to have superpowers that ebb and flow. OK, there's going to be times in your life where you are, are thriving in one area and perhaps in your view, lacking in others. But it's a good exercise to do every couple of years. Uh, one of the things that you've said, and, and you said that you, you, know, you came to this epiphany about your superpowers surrounded by some of your closest friends, you say in the book that you've long taken the approach that work Susan and after work Susan are one and the same person. Can you talk about that a little bit? Because I think a lot of people, you know, we talk and we hear about bringing your authentic self to work, uh, but we know there, you know there are some boundaries. So how do, you, how do you view that? And why is that important to this, to this conversation? Sure. Well, several things. One, you see me sitting in my living room with my cute Phoebe behind me. Um, so you already see a world of, of, of personal Susan that, you know, years ago wouldn't be possible. Um, two, it's hard enough being one person. So the thought of being two people, you know, why add that extra layer? Mm -hmm. And three, for those of you of age in the 90s, um, in the mid 90s, I, for the first time, started bringing a computer home at night at the end of the day. And as soon as I got home, I would plug my ginormous laptop, which was like the size of my refrigerator, into the wall and I would send and download my email messages. And while that was happening, I would go and do my dishes. I'd return to the computer. My hands were covered in suds. And honestly, that was the end of work Susan and home Susan. I know I sound like I'm being silly, but we spend so much of our given time at work. It is so much easier being the same person. I'm not suggesting we air our dirty laundry, but if we can open up just a tad bit more when we're safe, and, and I understand many people may not feel safe, but when we feel safe, by doing that, others will open up and you will create a more vibrant workplace that is more productive, more effective, and people will be much more likely to stay at the company as well as recommend the company. So you, you've said a few things so far that I think could maybe give people some hope or maybe lessen some of the reservation, hesitation, anxiety they might have about making connections. You know, one is that, you know, being the same person and making the case for really bringing your authentic self and that you don't have to have these two personas. And then two, which is a major theme throughout your book, which you've mentioned is, you know, offering to help others and kind of turning that network and instead of it about being me, 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 it's how can I help you? And I think, and you write about how um, that does take off some of the pressure and makes it a little bit easier. Can you talk a little bit more into um, the idea of helping others and that how that might help you in this gather phase and kind of bringing that constellation sure. of people together in your network? Well, I want to make sure folks don't think I, when I go to an event, that I run around just shaking hands saying, how can I help? But it's really learning to listen to the cues of ways you can be helpful. And for instance, Travelers is a major company, right? And those of you who work in different departments, it can be really powerful and empowering for you for your professional trajectory when you learn about others who are outside your core. You know, so if you're in sales, it can be really valuable to learn about the finance department or the marketing department or the HR department. And just by merely showing up and saying to people either virtually or, um, or you know, in, in, in your offices and being like, I've been at the company for X amount of time and I've learned this. Are there ways I can be helpful to you in you doing your job? 
And, you know, as long as you're authentic about it and not just, you know, tossing that out there, it's a great way to learn more about the entire organization, as well as learn and press into what your strengths are. You know, I, for 17 years of my career, worked at a company called PR Newswire, and I made it my absolute goal early on, all the way back in 1989, to learn, even though I was in marketing and sales, but to learn what the different departments were, just enough so I could be dangerous, but also so that I could be listening for cues of ways I can be helpful. And, and you talk about, um, you know, the five minute ask and the five minute favor. So we're getting into kind of the next section here, but I thought that was a really helpful way of, of, of making something very time limited, right? Because obviously you can't help everyone and you can't take on everyone else's projects and everyone else's work. But could you talk a little bit about kind of those time limited asks and maybe some sure. examples to make it a little bit easier? Of course. Well, the five minute ask um, came out of this notion that women specifically, we don't ask enough, right? Um, and this is a big generalization, but men typically tend to ask for what they want and deserve much more likely than women. So what I wanted to do was help women feel more comfortable making those asks. And I have found in my career that if we bring people along, as opposed to just boom, making the ass like, hi, I'm you know, building a company. Can you, you know, fund my company? Or hi, I joined a nonprofit board. Can you fund the nonprofit? Instead, keep people interested with almost a vested interest by keeping them informed. So over time, then when you do have an ask, it is they, they are already kind of um, taken with you, if that makes sense. Um, but I do want to um, stop for one sec, because after gather, there's a section called ask, which is a little bit different than the five minute ask I was talking about. And that ask is learning to ask the meaningful questions of others so that you can find out what their hopes and dreams are. And that way you can be helpful, correct? Um, so I just wanted to make sure I, I deciphered between the two. Fantastic. Thank you for that. Um, so when you're when you're going about kind of and then going back to this gather phase, when you're thinking about the types of people that you want to build in your network, can you talk a little bit about that? I know you mentioned, you know, it's not always exactly someone that maybe fits directly into your business plan um, and then how you build that real constellation sure, of sure. folks. Well, something my parents taught me very, very early on, and I am so grateful to the to for this notion, but that is every single person, no matter who they are, no matter where they come from, no matter where they live, no matter the color of their skin, is deserving of our compassion, kindness, interest, and curiosity. And by living that, it has really, really enabled me to build a very fulfilling, um, enriching life. Um, because we don't know what we don't know. And if we are afraid to open that door or make an in introduction to somebody, we're missing out on not only so much to learn from them, but learning things within, within ourselves. So I'm a huge believer in taking that leap with our, you know, with our colleagues, but also people we've never met. Um, and that is really, you know, it, when I think about just all the beautiful experiences. Also, if I could poll everyone, I'd love to say, you know, think about all the amazing things that have happened in your life. Almost all of them happened because of the connection, you know, if you think about it, right? So we need to be open to these things. We need to be, um, you know, it, it take down those walls, um, if, if I, can, I can term it like that. I also just um, grew up with parents who were serial connectors. And, you know, early, early on, as early as the, the 1970s, I assumed every everybody's parents were so for me it was just the norm but I understand for others it may it may be a little bit more challenging so if you're starting from scratch or your you know your network's a little rusty what what's maybe a, a first or second practical step to you know to jump start um, you know, building your network sure well we live in a beautiful era of technology and you know I made that early comment about the school bus um, and the kids but 
I am no Luddite. I mean, I love technology and boy, thank goodness we had Zoom and Microsoft Teams and Google Hangouts and FaceTime and everything during this pandemic because it would have been horrible. But the challenge is, is when we use these technologies and we're not intentional. So if we think about in the gather phase where I suggested you literally intentionally think about the people you want to connect with and reconnect with, make a list, okay? I know it sounds really you know, rudimentary, but make a list of 10, 20 people. I also, you know, we live in a beautiful time where we can reach out. You know, in the 80s, I worked for the newspaper USA Today. And I used to have to call to do interviews. I was a researcher, so my name was at the bottom of, of stories. To research people before I called them, I had, get this, the Encyclopedia Britannica, the Yellow Pages. I bet there's people on the call today that don't even know what the Yellow Pages are. Neither give you very much information. But guess what? Today you have something called the Google and whatever else search engine that you use. And you can find out almost anything and everything, unless someone is so blatantly private. But you can look up somebody's career tra trajectory on LinkedIn. You can see who you are connected to, to that person. You can see what they're upset about on Twitter. You can find out if they have grandchildren on Instagram. What I encourage you to do is find the, un I'm sorry, find the commonality in the uncommonality and use that to reach out. Now, not everyone's gonna respond. In fact, the vast majority won't, but that doesn't mean you can't try, but make it about them. Um, I'd love to another do a quick poll because this is something I know to be true. How many of you get a connecting, uh, I'm sorry, a connect request on LinkedIn? You say yes, and with an hour, somebody is selling you something. I'm sure that's happened to you, Jessica, yes? Mm -hmm. It's so frustrating. Now, what if instead the person reached out, you said yes, and then they said, Jessica, I understand you just got a major promotion at Travelers. Congratulations. Is there anything I can be doing um, to help you find? I know you need to fill your, your new department, and I know some good candidates. And, oh, by the way, I want to tell you about, wouldn't that be so much of a better way? So me, make a list. Look up a bit about each of the person, and when you reach out to them or reconnect with them, find some point of commonality. We all have it. When you're doing those reach outs, I know uh, you just mentioned like a LinkedIn example or you know a digital example. Um, can you run through some other scenarios where you might have to decide whether it's more appropriate maybe to meet in person versus do a digital reach out? I know you have a lot about the different signals that that sure. sends. Sure. Well, in terms of meeting in, in, in person, we all know, you know, for the past few years, it was challenging. So we had to get creative um, with technology. But now, hopefully, if we're, we're finally getting out of this pandemic, you know, the old meeting for coffee, uh, going for a walk and talk, um, going, you know, horseback riding, if that's your, if that's your flavor of, of, of choice, um, I think get creative. Um, the other thing is when you see someone at an event, if you're at a conference, a dinner party, you name it, don't be afraid to walk up to the person who's by themselves. I think we are always terrified um, because we fear rejection, but I almost guarantee you that when you walk up to that person and that person's alone, that person's gonna be so relieved because guess what? That person is not alone anymore. And yes, there's always that 1% chance that the person says to leave, leave me be, you'll move on. <laughs> but I think be creative. You know, I, I do walk and talks with people all the time. In fact, I think I have walked from Brooklyn to Montana and back um, during the pandemic, but it was also a safe and healthy way to keep in, in touch and also meet people that I hadn't met. That's fantastic and, and very practical. So thank you for thank you for sharing those. I do want to talk about uh, energy. Uh, people get their energy from different places, right? Some people get energy from being around others and are more extroverted. And some people get their energy from being alone and are more introverted. Can you talk about like we, when we think about, you know, building connections? I know during the pandemic, many of us have taken on additional responsibilities at home and elsewhere. 
Um, I would love to talk about the differences between where you get your energy and also how you just avoid burnout by taking on too much. Like how do you, how do you gauge uh, how much energy to invest and, and how often to do it? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll start with one thing around energy. Um, several years ago, I had the uh, fortunate opportunity to meet Adam Grant when he wrote his first book, Give and Take. And one of his contentions was the more meetings you take, meaning when people ask you to pick their brain or, you know, what have you, actually the more efficient and effective you become because you are so much more intentional about your time. Also, everyone you meet is a new resource so that down the road when you need help, guess what? You have people to tap. So it's not all about you taking on the effort, but diversifying the effort across <laughs> you know, various, various, let's just call them stakeholders, but people in your community, okay? Um, but I know for people who are introverted, um, for people who are shy, this notion of connecting is horrifying. But this is where it's important to recognize the differences between transactional networking, which is very much one to 100, one to many, to connecting, which is much more one-on-one -on -one, um, and one-on-two. And I often say before you are going to an event or even a, a virtual event, if you are shy or introverted, I like to think in the power of threes or what I called in the book, the triumvirate, where you go with the intention of meeting three people, learning three things about those three people and sharing three things. And then you can go hide in the bathroom or go back to your hotel room and, and order room service. But the notion is, is you don't have to, you know, I know we feel the pressure sometimes that we have to meet everyone. And the other thing is we have the luxury now, oftentimes, not always, to be able to know who's gonna be in the room before we go. So you can think ahead and look up who those three people are that hopefully you can help out or perhaps they can be helpful to you. But that intentionality can relieve some of the stress and the burdens. I also think that exercise of thinking about what your super, superpowers are before you walk into these rooms can be really healthy. And believe me, I do it because even though I appear like go and all like misconfident here, I'm terrified of my own shadow. So before I go to events, I often think, what is it? What are my bag of, what's in my bag of tricks that I can lead with? So hopefully those are some little teeny tidbits. That's great. And I, I think going in with a plan and having a strategy and knowing, and knowing what you want to accomplish, I think does take, you know, some of the, some of the fear out of it yes. and makes it more intentional. So that's fantastic. Um, so preparing for a meeting, um, you, you give a lot of really tangible tips in the book. Um, for, for one example, you say you should be able to stand up and basically give someone their Oscar speech, right? <laughs> that person, and you just talked about doing a little bit of research. Can you, can you dig into that Oscar speech a little bit more for us? Of course. Um, and I can give you a little bit of background on that. For years, I have um, hosted a lot of events. I love to, because I love making connections. It's like my, my crypt, well, the opposite of my kryptonite. And what I do to make introductions, instead of saying, Jessica, meet Belinda, I'd be like, Jessica, I want you to meet Belinda because you both went to Northeastern and then you happened to overlap when you lived in New York City. And oh, by the way, you both love hummus. So instead of just saying, Jessica, meet Belinda, Belinda, meet Jessica, I try to bring in some minimal little factoids. So what I call in the book, the Oscar speech is, you, you know, when you watch the Tonys or the Emmys or the Academy Awards, when they introduce the person coming up on stage, they give a whole lot of information about that person, ranging from all the films that person has starred in to, you know, what that person's favorite designer is to what that person's favorite breakfast cereal is. So I'm not suggesting you have to do all of that, but when you make introductions, if you can shows the person you're making the intro to that you have seen and heard the other person, it's the greatest gift we can give one another. And you're helping solidify the start of a meaningful connection. What happens after you can't control, but you're almost like if you think about when you plant a seed in the ground, if you give it fertilizer, guess what happens? And some extra water. But if you just plant that seed, good luck. 
Yeah, that's that's very very good advice. Um, another thing you you said about so you 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 know you have a you have a meeting you're meeting you're connecting, um, and I think many of us have probably had this experience. You you follow up with a person and then they ghost you, right? They don't they don't respond, and you're sitting there thinking, what did, did I do something wrong? Did it you know did it not did I not make the connection? Um, and you talk about giving three options and you break down kind of the psychology of some of the reasons why people might not respond to you. And I, I thought that was very insightful. I'm wondering if you can talk about that a little bit. Oftentimes people don't respond because they can't, right? I mean, you know, we know people are busy, but more often than not, they feel like they can't be helpful. When we send out a request um, and just give somebody one option, we're, we're, doing, we're not doing ourselves any favors. So I'm a big believer in give people choices. Um, and those of you who in the, are in here today who've been in sales training knows this, that, you know, it's easy for somebody to say, hi, do you want to buy this product? And of course they're, you know, no, <laughs> but it's scary to write back the negative. But instead, if you say, you know, here's this great new product. Also, you know, here's some sample social media posts, or would you be so kind to forward this to three other people? you're much more likely to get a response from people. Again, helping build the, that connective tissue. So do what you can to make it easy for the other person, which I realize is a little bit bigger of a lift, but why wouldn't you do everything you can to get a response, right? Yeah, yeah, that's terrific, that's terrific. Um, now I wanna move forward to the do section. Um, yeah. You've said in the past that this third step in your method is one of one of your favorites and one that you're most fond of. Can you talk about that a little bit and frame it out for us? Yes. Um, and um, just to lead in, so we had gather, then we had ask, where you learn to ask the meaningful questions of others. And if you listen very, very carefully, which I know can be challenging for many of us, myself included, but then you get to the do phase. And the do phase is where you become reliable, responsible, resourceful, and all the things that make you a success, both personally and professionally, meaning you follow up, you follow through, you make those introductions. Um, and that is where I tend to love to live because all the magic that can come when people are connected, the companies that are funded, the impact that can make, that can be made, the couples that fall in love, for goodness sakes. I've introduced three that are now married. So there you go. <laughs> but the do phase is really important. But I also just want to caution, it doesn't mean you have to do everything the next day after you meet someone. This is the long haul. This is over time. And there are going to be times in your life where you can't be helpful, where you can't make introductions. And that's okay. But this is, again, over the years. It's being um, responsive and resourceful. Great, great. And you talked about follow-up action. Yes. Um, why is that? What are some of the biggest mistakes that people make when following up? Well, how many of you, when somebody pops in your brain and you're like, oh, I need to get in touch with that person. And then you're like, I'll get to it later. And you never do. Okay. So one is not prioritizing. Two, not making notes. I am a slave to making lists um, and lists of lists, which I know sometimes can be counterproductive to some people. I also use voice recording so that when I am out for a walk or if I'm, I'm driving, I might then remind myself, I need to follow up, I need to do this. I'm also a huge believer in do it right away, okay? I know it's easy to say, I'll get to it next week or I'll get to it tomorrow, and then we know what happens. Most importantly, when you do follow up, make mention of something in the conversation because that way you're basically stating to the other person that you heard them, that you saw them, that you listened to them. So instead of just saying, it was great meeting you at the, the traveler's dinner last night, say, it was great talking about that amazing new podcast, blah, 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 blah. Um, I'd love to keep in touch. What is your mode of connection? WhatsApp, email, or phone? Find out what how people want to stay in touch and make note of it in their contact information. So it seems like really listening and picking yes. up on those really listening and picking up on those details are are critical to making yeah. and deepening and deepening a relationship. And you and you talk about that as well, just the importance of listening. And I, I just can you hit on that a little bit more? Sure, sure. Well, I encourage all of you 
to listen to Dr. Julian Treasure's um, various TED Talks on the subject. Uh, I um, got to interview him and I was blown away, but he is the master when it comes to learning to listen. And um, a couple of tips he, he said, uh, which now I do much more religiously. And one is when I am listening to someone, whether it's a speech or in a conversation, and I find my mind going off to the Thai food I want to order for lunch or the dishes that are in my sink, I actually fess up. I mean, if somebody's on stage, I'm not gonna like interrupt the speaker, but I will say to the person, Jessica, I'm so sorry, I lost you there for a minute. Can you repeat what you said? Which 10 years ago, I probably would have been terrified to admit, but to me now, it's actually a lovely thing to do because it shows the person you actually care. Two, I write stuff down while someone is talking so that when I do the follow-up, um, I have that kind of at the ready. And lastly, do everything you can to do to not do what I have been guilty of, and that is um, reactionary listening. I'm so excited to get into the do phase that I'm already thinking about how I can be helpful rather than just focusing. So um, try not to do that. So those would be three quick little things, but if you listen to his talks, you will you will become the world's best listeners. Fantastic. And I'm sure there's more recommendations that we can probably get to there in terms of how to keep expanding your, your mind on, on this topic. I do want to pivot and get to some audience questions. We're getting a bunch, we're getting a bunch coming in. Um, first one from Danielle Klotzek. I often think about reaching out, but then I put it off until I have magically more time or mental energy to catch up. I'm always stunned and guilty about how much time has lapsed. How do you prevent the lapses and also conquer the anxiety over reaching out after a long period? Take ownership, be truthful. You know, this, this, this pandemic again is the great commonality. And, you know, you always risk that you're gonna reach out and somebody isn't gonna respond, but you know what? You did the right thing by trying. And I think instead of, you know, coming up with all sorts of excuses, just be honest, I've lost touch and I, I feel badly and I want to make amends. And you, of course, run that scary risk that you will be ghosted. It's happened to me multiple times. But the beautiful thing is, I imagine you also have other, you know, hundreds of other people in your community that if that happens, you can reach out to them. Yeah, perfect. All right. How many connections are too many, Jonathan? <laughs> that is such a, I don't mean personal, like you can't ask, ask me, but I think that that depends. I mean, I know some people who have a very small circle and they thrive with that and they have meaningful connections. So I don't think it's necessarily the number. I think it goes back to thinking about what your goals are, what you hope to achieve. Um, I think it's also thinking about ways you can be helpful to others. So it's, it's hard to put a number on that. Um, but, you know, you will know when it's too many. I'll tell you that much. <laughs> okay. All right, great. Dallas Downey asks, what's your stance on being your true self when connecting with someone versus behaving how you think you should when connecting? <sighs> I think in my 20s and 30s, I thought way too much. So there is something that comes with age where you are more comfortable in your own skin. Um, this is also, and I know I sound like a broken record, where you think about your superpowers and lead with them. Um, and that helps you be more authentic. I do think people are pretty smart and they can see through when you're not yourself. But um, but just as, you know, almost like a mantra before you go to a, a meeting or an event or a dinner, tell yourself those things so that it is easier to be yourself. Yeah, that's good. Some some positive affirmations yeah. Yeah. Um, on the way to go. Absolutely. Um, all right. Bailey Alexander wants to know, what advice do you have for keeping conversations going? I sometimes find myself at a stall when networking at in-person events where the conversation has just tapered off. How do I leave a lasting impact to the point where they will remember me and they'll want to talk to me in the future? Oh, my goodness. First of all, um, Bailey, thank you for that question. Um, make it about them. OK, um, you know, I know we know ourselves the best, but sometimes if we ask, have have ready questions in our back pocket we can keep the conversation going. I mean, obviously you don't wanna keep it going where it's artificial, 
But I like to have questions like, you know, what is the best thing that happened to you in the last week? Or if you could go anywhere tomorrow and money wasn't a question, where would you go on the planet and why? Or, you know, what was the favorite vacation you took before the pandemic? Or, you know, a real goofy one is what was your, what is your favorite, you know, this may be something you would say with a colleague, not necessarily somebody you, you don't really know, but what was your favorite food as a child? Um, that tends to elicit all kinds of thoughts. But again, I think, you know, having questions at the ready, um, certainly there's, you know, th there's topics today because of kind of the vitriol we're living in. So, you know, politics is probably something you don't want to have to to deal with it, certainly on the on your first meeting, but things like, you know, what is your favorite podcast? Have you watched a good series? Um, you know, I know a lot of people uh, end up talking about sports, um, but have those questions at the ready and make it more about the other person than about yourself. Yeah, a little, a little preparation goes a long way, going back to your Oscar speech as well. Okay, uh, how do we stay organized in a world gone crazy with email um, and still have time to make personal connections? Any suggestions that work with you? The thing is, is yes, we all live in email, dare I say hell, and then we have Slack, and then we have WhatsApp, and then we have text, and then we have phone, and we have smoke signals, and FedEx, and UPS, and everything else. Um, I think, you know, you almost have to schedule it on your calendar once a day. And one of the things I did during the pandemic that I am continuously doing now is every morning before my coffee, I reach out to three people and I reach out to them in a way that I'm not expecting necessarily a return. And it's one of three things. One, just sending some love or like, you know, whatever. Two, asking the person how they're doing and letting them know you're thinking of them. And three, I live alone. I'm single. I don't have parents. I don't have kids. So sometimes it's me just saying, hey, don't forget me. Okay. But sometimes people respond and sometimes people don't. But what I do is I go ahead and it's the three names that pop in my head. It's fantastic. Um, so you gave us a little glimpse into your calendar and how you organize some of this and how you, uh, when we're approaching networking events or just even on our daily rituals, um, go about framing some of this out. Um, but we've gotten some questions about lang language and you know how we make these asks or how we you know make these connections. Um, Kristen Salmon asks, are there key phrases that you think help to create a better sense of connectivity with people, both with clients and employees? Well, um, how many of us have been in meetings and the first subject matter we all, whether it's a Zoom or a conference call or a meeting in real life, goes to the weather, okay? I bet everybody's hand would raise, right? Look, we're living in a time of climate, weather's important, but if we sit here and talk about the weather in Minneapolis today, we don't learn anything about anything other than the weather in Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. We don't learn about each other. We don't share anything. And the reason people do it is because it's safe and it feels comfortable. So instead, let's start the meetings talking about how we really are. And I like to quote Brene Brown, where she says, instead of, Jessica, how are you today? She'll say, Jessica, in three words, tell me how you're feeling today. And then you don't run into the, meh, I'm okay, I'm fair, I'm good, right? It gets people thinking and talking. Um, and I also think it's really imperative in this world now where we have some people in the office and some people who are not, that we do everything we can to bring the people who are not physically in the office to feel like they belong. Because if not, we've all been there when, you know, we're on a, we're in a room and there's somebody on a conference line and we can for completely forget that person's there. So instead, we have to be extraordinarily intentional to bring that person in the room, even before the meeting, stating to the person, how can we make, or the many people, how do we bring you into this conversation and make you feel more like you belong? We've gotten, we're getting some questions about social media, and I know, you know, there's lots of conversations about, you know, potentially it being disconnecting. Can you talk about the role of social media and how that plays into either disconnection or connection? Well, it can be dangerous. There's, there's no doubt. And I think back to the early days of Twitter when I started something on Twitter called CSR chat, which stood for corporate responsibility chat. And it was my way to help connect people in the corporate responsibility place. It wasn't me blasting out what I had for breakfast. It wasn't me talking about my accomplishments. It was me showcasing others. And to this day, you know, 16, 17 years later, 
I find that social media can be a wonderful way to showcase people that you care about, that you admire, perhaps people you haven't met, but people you want to meet, right? All of us can use a little bit of dopamine in our lives. So again, you could set up a weekly, I'm going to showcase one person a week on whatever platform is most comfortable to you. It could be TikTok, for goodness sakes. It could be um, LinkedIn, but do it um, like a muscle, like you'd want to exercise a muscle. So, and that way we're putting more positive juju into the world as opposed to contributing to the vitriol because it can be really, really powerful. And back to that Oscar speech, when we can show publicly somebody's accomplishments, we are being, we're being truly good humans, right? I mean, in the end, isn't that what we all want to be? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And you, you, you talk about reciprocity in the book as well. And, um, you know, how that, how that, what, you know, what you, what you put out comes back to you. Um, and I just thought that was a, that was a nice, a nice section as well. Um, Jessica, if I can share one quick story that I think is so very true about reciprocity and also this notion of um, not being afraid to take risks, meeting people that we've never met um, because we've, you know, don't know enough about them. Um, in 2017, it was a Tuesday afternoon. I still remember it like it was yesterday. I got an email from a friend who works for UBS and she said, Susan, I was hoping you could help my friend Brandt, a filmmaker, get into a, a refugee camp in Greece tomorrow. Now, to level set, I, for years, have served on the board of the UN High Commission for Refugees. So it wasn't totally out of left field. However, one, it's not easy to get someone in a refugee camp. Two, it was the next day. And three, my mind kept saying, the last thing the world needs is another documentary film about refugees that no one's going to see. But I realized I had 20 minutes, make a few calls. Lo and behold, I got what I thought was a documentary filmmaker into that refugee camp. Well, I learned two weeks later that he wasn't a documentary filmmaker. He was a big budget Hollywood film director. And a couple months later, another friend said to me, Susan, do you happen to know any filmmakers who could go spend a week to two weeks at a refugee camp on the Syrian border to teach kids how to make films, to talk about their experiences. Well, guess what? I called Brandt. Not only did he say yes, but he brought eight other Hollywood bigwigs to go spend a week and teach these kids how to make film. But there's more. He created a uh, short film called Refugee um, that Angelina Jolie happened to see and has been taking that film on the world stage to remind world leaders that there is still very much a real and dire refugee crisis going on. And that short is now gonna be a big budget film that's gonna come out next year. So the moral of the story is, I'm not taking credit for all of that happened, but I like to think that I played a tiny little role in making that introduction. And I have to tell you, I no longer like let my preconceived notions lead. And that is the power of meaningfully connecting. Yeah, wow, that that is very powerful and a very good highlight example of you never know where things yes. are going to evolve to. Yeah, it's yes. amazing. That's amazing. Um, and I and I think to get us there, you know, I'm seeing a lot of questions coming in. Um, you know, how do you you talked about taking that risk, you know, just to get over that hump and you know, speak up and have that conversation and make that connection and stay open to those conversations. So we're getting uh, some folks that are asking, you know, how do you deal with uh, rejection, real or perceived um, in, in some cases, or the anxiety of, of potentially having to deal with that? I wish I knew the answer to that, honestly. Um, rejection sucks. And I, the only thing I can think of is if you make more, there's less, right? Um, and I know that sounds kind of goofy, but it's true. And it's, it's just a part of life. And you also just have to realize that, you know, when we reach out to people, it's not that people are more important than us. You know, I, um, this is going to be goofy, but my late mom always said, even Queen Elizabeth passes gas. And her point was, sorry about that analogy, but the point was, we're all human. We all, we all have insecurities. We all feel, um, you know, when we walk into rooms that we don't belong, but guess what? We really do. Every single one of us 
then no one is superior to us, even if they have a bigger job or make more money. It doesn't matter. What were your biggest takeaways from writing this book? What's been maybe some of the most rewarding reactions that you've that you've gotten or feedback or just, you know, how are people reacting to it? Well, honestly, um, Jessica gets to be invited to be in rooms like this and meet people like you, um, to have the privilege to be able to talk to, you know, amazing colleagues of yours. Um, I think it's also this notion that we can lead a life where we're helpful to others. And that doesn't mean we're giving up our first child or we're, yeah. we're not taking care of ourselves. Um, but sometimes merely an introduction to somebody else is being hugely of value. Um, I would say also just a, a quick side note, I was able to dedicate the book to my mom who I lost when I was very young to a tragedy. And in my 20s, I used to fantasize that if I ever wrote a book, the most exciting thing would be able to give a, um, you know, it, it, dedicate it to her on that white page. And to this day, you know, that was one of the greatest gifts of being able to write this book. That's wonderful. And I, I, I was touched by the stories that you shared of, of your family and, and watching your parents model these behaviors for you and, and serve as serial connectors. And, you know, we've actually gotten a lot of questions from folks as well about youth and how you talk to young people and model the way. And it seems like you've got the perfect basis for that. So I wonder if you could maybe give some, some folks some pointers on mm -hmm. you know, having these conversations with young people today and uh, helping to nudge them along in their journey to become, you know, uh, to have that human connection. Well, and, and I feel for them after the two years of this pandemic, right? I mean, you know, they started out, th this, this young generation grew up with, with, you know, screens, right? So to me, as um, the older persons in the relationship, it's our responsibility to not live on our screens, right? And actually, you know, demonstrate how connections make a world a better place, right? So if we're, you know, glued to our screens, guess what? We're not serving as the model. And I think it's also important to impress some people that there's money to be made and there's businesses to be built and impact to be made through connections, meaning it's not all just for fun. Um, and there is fun along the way. Um, but the point is, is this is really valuable to people in their 20s, in their 30s and in their 60s and 70s, because everything happens or, you know, if you think about it as the spark, but those sparks come based on our human connection. Susan, I think that's a perfect way to, to end the hour. Any final thoughts that you'd like to share with our audience today? Well, filled with gratitude for all of you. Um, I will say if one thing you should all need to know that if you make dedicating time, energy to building meaningful connections, a regular habit, it's as good as running every day and eating kale every day in terms of your health and longevity. So I love kale. I live in Brooklyn, um, but my running days aren't quite what they used to be. Um, and so I would say if this is going to help my health, then so be it. Um, so that would be my final thoughts. But thank you. Thank you, Jessica. And thank you to Joanne Woodward and the rest of the crew at um, Travelers. I'm so touched to have been here. Susan, thank you so much. That was um a really fantastic hour and I and I hope that we armed people with some really practical guidance on how to approach building their networks and building their connections um, and feeling more fulfilled in the process. So thank you very much. I'm going to take this opportunity now just to preview some of the programs that we have coming up here at the Travelers Institute. Um, so thank you, Susan, again, and thanks everyone for tuning in. There's a link in our survey about today's program in the chat, so please uh, fill it out and let us know what you thought about today's session. Uh, and then looking ahead, as I mentioned, on November 16th, we'll welcome Ian Brzezinski, a senior fellow at the Atlantic Council. Um, and uh, we're going to talk about issues of energy and stability in the Balkans, as well as the impact on the Russian invasion in Ukraine and Europe and geopolitical hotspots. On November 30th, we'll have a chat with Peter Miller, president and CEO of the Institutes, uh, on what uh, to power our credentials with and, and the future of um, education within the insurance industry. And then on December 7th, we'll speak with Laura Liswood on the business imperative of diversity, equity, and inclusion. So as always, thank you for spending the hour with us. We know there's lots of ways that you can spend your time in the afternoon. So we appreciate you being here with us and we'll see you next week. Thank you.